Audience, we'll continue to talk with John Barney. <laughs> I want to thank you for, jo for joining us on Views with Joyce Waddell. And we're going to be talking about helping people because that's what John does. And we know that people need help. We are like, we are our brother's keepers and we must help each other. And so our topic for tonight is helping people. We've had John Barnett here once before, so we're continuing to talk with him about the good things that he's doing in this community as he helps to make the community a much better and a much safer place for all of us. One of the things that he gives us as advice is that we need to always be in touch with an attorney and know we need to know our legal rights. So as we help people, we must also help ourselves. Welcome, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. John, thank you, one of the things that we know in helping people, we must know our legal rights. And a lot of times people can't help themselves because they don't know what they can and cannot do. That's they don't right. know what legally they have access to mm -hmm. because they just don't know. They've never been taught. They've never seen it. And so they just rely on the system to tell them what to mm -hmm. do. That's correct. Uh, I was talking to someone earlier today and I informed them that um, in 15 years of doing thug and civil rights, I've never signed up a member of the Nation of Islam. Never. And it blew my mind because I'm thinking, wow, why is that? And I, I realized that they know the law. They respect the law. They understand the dynamics of the law. And because of that, I've yet to sign anyone up that needs civil rights assistance in the Nation of Islam. It has never happened in 15 years. Is there a policy with the Nation of Islam that they will not um, sign up with anybody other than their own? Well, I think one thing that you have to commend them on, and I'm a church goer, so to speak. I'm a church brother who goes to a church in Gaston, your Tabernacle Baptist Church. But what you have to admire is that they don't have themselves in predicaments where they're going to get in trouble. For instance, if there's excessive towing of cars during CIAA weekend, they're not out spending money lavishly during CIAA weekend. So they're less reluctant to get in trouble to deal with that predatory towing. Uh, their sons are being taught their history, whereas most mothers are in the kitchen cooking, unfortunately on the cell phone, and their sons are out in the streets, unfortunately selling drugs. So I think what happens is that they put themselves uh, in, a, in a predicament where they don't or they're not exposed to all the dynamics that can happen to an individual just by living in a neighborhood. And I think that's, that's a plus for them. Um, and I think we need to kind of take heed to that. But I think it's very important that we study the law and learn the law. Um, you know, that's something that we don't learn in school. We learn a lot of things, but, but taking care of ourselves legally mm -hmm. is something that we really aren't taught in school unless it's an, an elective course, but we're not that taught in depth mm -hmm. about situations that we may find ourselves in. That's correct. Reverend Sharpton told me there's two books that Afro-Americans uh, do not read often, and that's the Bible and the Book of Law. And so when you look at that, you know, yes, we go to church, we know a couple of scriptures, but reading it on a daily basis, that's something I think we failed in. Uh, and then also the Book of Law and knowing the dynamics, knowing when laws changed. They just passed a lynching law two years ago. Um, in the 50s, there wasn't a lynching law because we were the ones getting lynched. But now, since everybody seemed to be getting lynched, they passed a law a couple years ago in North Carolina. So now, if three or more people beat you up, you can actually process uh, a charge against those individuals for a lynching law. And it was really sparked after Gina Six, after six black males, unfortunately, um, beat a white male up. And so that law has been passed, but how many people know that that law has been passed unless you study the law? And I've been blessed to work in civil rights, so I learned the law. I learned the dynamics of divorce and wrongful terminations because I have victims. So when the victims call me back after I give them a law, they'll say, this is what I got. I got a PJC. What's a PJC? Prayer for judgment. You can get two every five years. That means you get a little minor speeding ticket, they can throw it away, and you can move on with your life and just pay the court costs. But how many people in Charlotte know about a, a prayer for judgment? And it's just what it is. It's a prayer for judgment. You go to church, you pray for a blessing. When you go to court, you pray to judge, <laughs> don't give you a charge. And so, but how many people know about those? No, John, we're in August now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going this is, we're in the month of August okay. as we are viewing what we're talking about okay. now. 
But um, you've been arrested many times, mm -hmm. haven't you? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. In the last four years, I have. How many times within the last four years have you? Three times. Oh, that's not a lot. Yeah, three times. That's about the, that's about the average for an African-American male, isn't it? Yeah, and it's even higher in D.C. That's correct. And e even D.C. is a ba basically a... Uh, they said that a they, city of the Washington D.C. where you have 90 percent African Americans. That's correct. They said that 81 percent of the black men that's in Washington D.C. if he has been arrested in jail or sent to prison. Well, evidently there must be African Americans arresting other African Americans. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And in South Carolina is number one in the country with the most African American males in prison. They just ran a report today that um, Myrtle Beach is the worst beach in the country. So South Carolina has a lot of issues, not only just Charlotte, but other areas. It's the worst beach in the country worst, for African-American men. Just in general, uh, the worst beach. Oh, why is that? Wor worse in what way? Well, I guess with, with the flag issue, uh, businesses shutting down, uh, economically it's not doing well, but they, it sounded like they brought it on themselves. So they labeled that as the worst beach in the country today. The, the city bought it on themselves, or African Americans bought it on themselves? I think the city did, because the city has the right to uh, treat us a little better than they do, more so if there's a bike week going on a week prior to the Afro American bike week, and they're not challenged. Uh, the NWCP monitors um, the bike show, which predominantly draws the white bikers. And the NWCP actually goes down, myself and other members of the NWCP and Gastonia and Clover, we actually go down during that week and we actually sit in restaurants and we monitor how they treat the customers. But then the following week is the Afro-American Major Bike Week and the dynamics totally changed during that week, uh, drastically. Well, you know what, African-American people have their own beach, they have the Atlantic Beach and they could have made that whatever, we as a people could have made that what we wanted it to be. That's correct, but I think but we, that it, but, we, but we didn't. Yeah, but I think that any beach, whether, whether Jones Beach or Myrtle Beach, they should treat us with respect and serve us the same way in the restaurants as they did for or do for anyone else. John, you've been on the civil rights road traveling that mm -hmm. for a long time, mm -hmm. and you've encountered many things. What would you say has been the most challenging experience as a civil rights crusader? Uh, encouraging Afro-American pastors to allow us to use their church to help people in their church when I'm not from that city. I think that's been one of our biggest challenges. Um, whenever you go to a city, of course the first stop is the Afro-American neighborhood as, as, as it relates to the cases we address. And the first resource center would be the church. Uh, but I think I spend hours talking to a pastor saying, you know, please let Reverend Sharpton come speak at your church. Uh, you may not care for him, but trust me, your members of your church want to hear him speak. And I think Dr. King dealt with the same thing during his Birmingham letters. Uh, th those letters were for Afro-American pastors. And I think once we... But it didn't address African-American pastors as such in the letters. Exactly, in the letters. But he did, he did have some forms of... Uh, uh, words that he used to let them know that he's not there as an agitator, that he's actually there to help the individuals in that city. But his greatest fame came after his death. That's correct, that's correct. And I think that's what happens, unfortunately, with a lot of uh, leaders. Sometimes they don't understand what we're doing now, but later on down the road, you know, they may identify with the fact that I'm glad we got those buses geared up to, to leave out of Charlotte for Gina 6. I'm glad we got those buses for Barack Obama. I'm glad you got Dr. King's holiday approved where my son don't have to go to school on Dr. King's birthday in York or in Gastonia. So I guess what we have to do is, as civil rights leaders is just continue to do the work. Now John, most of the things that you're involved in, I know you were involved in the, and you're still involved in the shooting mm -hmm. uh, recently, in, 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 many of them in Gastonia, in York, in, in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Now, when you come to do work in Charlotte, do sh does Charlotte not only does it have its own leaders? Well, they do, but we never, we never uh, accept a case unless the family uh, have reached out to other civil rights organizations or any, others, or any other organization that can assist them. We've been getting the calls from individuals who say no one called us back. Oh, we called this organization, they didn't call back. We called this pastor, they didn't call us back. So a lot of our calls are really uh, 
kind of like cold calls. People are just calling us, just looking for help. And so that's when we go in and assist those individuals, if we don't already have our plates full with other cases. So there are some organizations. I wish they were more. Are you still with Action Network? Yeah, I'm still a member of National Action Network, still a member of the Rainbow Push Coalition, still a member of the NWCP um, in the York County area, Gastonia as well. And so when you come into Charlotte uh, to work with a family mm -hmm. who's experienced a tragedy, mm -hmm. You come in as the National Action. No, I come in as Thug, just the Thug Ministry. Yeah, exactly. Na if you came as National Action, you'd have to get permission from the headquarters. That's correct. You? The National Action Network actually I retired two years ago. It, uh, what happened? I retired two years ago after ten years. What happened with National Action Network is that we were working on cases nationally. I was working with Gina Six and. We uh, assisted with the Sean Bell case, that's in New York. But people in my own neighborhood in Gastonia were getting beat up, so to speak, by the police. People were being wrongfully terminated at Wix in Gastonia. And so what happens is I created Thug and revamped it from a prison outreach to a civil rights initiative. So now I'm able to help more people locally. And we're serving three states right now, North Carolina, South Carolina, and in Georgia. On the Thug Ministries. That's correct, that's correct. True healing on the God. That's correct, that's correct. And so it has grown um, tremendously now. So do you have people that work under you? Yes, we have about five assistants. And what I do is I utilize an assistant in the cities that we work at. So if I'm in Kannapolis, it's Sister Brandy. If it's in Charlotte, I use Sister Sharon. Um, so I always utilize a sister in that particular, or a brother in that city um, to help us with that family's needs. Now, as you travel, do you have bodyguards that travel with you? Is there any time that you have to have a bodyguard? No, no, never, never, never had a bodyguard. But you, ha you see people like, doesn't Shopton go with, uh, travel with a bodyguard? You know Jesse what? Jackson travels with bodyguards? Very seldom do Reverend Shopton have bodyguards. Um, because nowadays they don't, nowadays they don't, and I guess getting into my own personal issues, uh, they don't shoot down leaders the way they did in the 60s. You see, they shot Malcolm X, they shot Meg Evers, and they shot Dr. King. Right. Nowadays, you don't have to shoot Barack Obama. You just say his middle name is Hussein, so he must be a Muslim. You don't have to shoot down Jesse Jackson. You just said, unfortunately, he had a baby out of wedlock. You don't have to shoot down Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton. You just say, you know, he uh, was a booking agent for James Brown for 10 years. So if you're able to kill the person's character, then the media may try to try to distort your name or utilize different tactics to kill your name so that your people or the people that want to hear your voice, whether black or white, will not listen to you. So they silence your mouth by killing your character. Michael Jackson was labeled as the king of pop. Maybe some Elvis fans didn't like that. Whatever the case may be, no one else can generate 100,000 people, a sea of people. So what did they do to kill his name? They said he raped a little white boy. Uh, and it goes on and on when you look at leaders. They'll try to attack the character. Bill Clinton, you know, you can go on and on with that. So, so there are other ways of destroying people that's than correct. killing them. And when you destroy the character, that's much more dangerous, exactly. much more damaging. Exactly. So in, in the 60s, Dr. King and Malcolm X probably needed a bodyguard. Nowadays, leaders need a lawyer. And I think that would be the difference uh, in 2010. Or do they need both of them? <laughs> no. Hypothetically speaking, I think they need a lawyer. Uh, Nicky Mackey needed a lawyer. Uh, uh, my brother James Barnett. You know, all of the different images. Pat Cannon, Claude Alexander. You know, all of those individuals, brothers who I look up to, um, didn't really need a bodyguard. They needed a good lawyer in place. And I think that's, like I say, overall purpose is to kill the character. Once you kill the character, then, you know, Chris Brown had a fight with Rihanna. Chris Brown, I don't care what you say, he's one of the most greatest talents on this planet Earth right now. But because he had that fight and he ran it in the media so much. And so is that a way of the majority community destroying um, an image through racism? Is that a racial well, I always way call of dealing with human beings? Well, you got Afro-American reporters that tear down Afro-American leaders. So I think it's just, it's just they have to be aware of knowing what the truth is. So it's a human being, exactly. it's a human thing. Exactly, I think if the media just puts out one side of the story and the people don't hear the other side, then they have no choice but to go with what they're hearing. Well, how can the people get the, the, the persons who's been attacked and prosecuted, how can they get their story out? They, they do what the old Bible says, the, the biblical message in that is that when you have a problem with your brother or sister, you go to your brother and you tell your brother, 
I don't like what you did or I'm not don't like what you're doing. Say for instance feud between Tavis Smiley and, Mal and, and um, Al Sharpton, that's correct. And th was it ever resolved? I don't think I, so. I, I think that generally they love each other. Uh, I get in arguments with my brother, my sisters, but at the end of the day we have Is it turfed and everybody's no. <laughs> I think buying for the same turf and the same audience and one wants to be greater than the other. So Yeah, well you know you do have the alpha male syndrome that goes on. But I think that if you have problems with your brother, you need to go to them. Uh, whatever Tavis Malley did, he should have went to Al Sharpton. Uh, he can call the National Action Network and talk to him on the People phone. People don't do that. Yeah, they don't do that. Right? Well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And audience, too, I want to thank you for being with us as we will continue to talk with Brother Barnett at another time. Thank you.
audience, we had to end our interview with John Burnett just a little early because he had a call to go into the community where the work that he's doing is so much needed. He's been working with Thug Ministry for a long while, helping people, and that's why we call this program Helping in Our Community. That was our topic for tonight. He's been very active, and what he does is volunteer work. North Carolina, South Carolina, and he travels throughout. There's always a need for people to help. And there are many ways that we can help, but we have to find our way to make a difference in life by helping others. And that was his. And that's why we chose to highlight what he's doing in this community. And now we'll conclude our program with music. Thank you for being with us on Views with Joyce Waddell. Tune in again next week for another interesting program.